These abandoned houses in the Namibian desert were once homes, but the harshness of the climate proved too much for their inhabitants, and they now stand empty. The atmosphere punishes living beings with sudden changes of temperature and humidity, forcing them to seek out places in which to shelter for at least a few hours each day. All animals need some form of refuge, however simple in which to rest, reproduce, store food or hide from their enemies. The home in the form of a burrow, nest or den, though it may be just a simple rocky hollow, is vital for life. And so animals have developed different strategies to obtain one, depending on where they live, the climate and the available materials in the different ecosystems of the earth. Human beings had to solve these same problems and underwent a technical evolution from caves to large complex constructions. But human dwellings are determined not only by questions of climate and safety, the needs and lifestyle of each culture are also different. All the survivors of the planet Earth need a place to live. A shelter is essentially and above all a place to which to escape, a hideaway affording protection from predators and enemies. Many have, in addition, chosen to live in communities. This means they had to build homes which were larger but also safer because while some worked, others could stand guard. The first hominids also formed part of the diet of the great wild carnivores, and one form of defense was to take shelter in caves and natural hiding places. But soon these basic primitive cave dwellings and comfortably dark and damp proved inadequate for a growing human population. And at the same time as man mastered fire, he was better able to keep predators at bay. But the caves were ideal for use as spiritual and magical sanctuaries. They thus became the shelters of the ancestors, places of worship in which to house the dead, preserving and protecting the riches they were to take with them into the other life. Here in Peru, centuries ago, the Chachapoya built these dwellings in inaccessible caves in which they lay to rest their illustrious dead to keep them safe from water and grave robbers alike. Very close by on a precipice, they also placed these sarcophagi containing mummies. When ancient cultures like this one left the caves to the dead, they began to build more suitable shelters for the living, and so the first settlements were born. The Chachapoya were called the Cloud People. Their civilization was conquered by the Incas in the 15th century before the arrival of the Spanish. The inhabitants of these first large communal shelters needed to protect their crops and cattle from attacks by other human groups. Thus, the great fortified city-states were born and fought against each other. But protected inside the shelters he built, man spread out across the earth to both cold, humid regions and burning deserts. All other animals have had to face the same problems of climate and safety and have overcome them with different adaptation strategies. One of the oldest methods is fortifying the body itself, turning the skin into protective armor. It's rather like carrying your house on your back, 
an onerous though efficient solution. But always having to carry your shelter with you reduces mobility, making movement slow and noisy, and therefore liable to attract predators. This python is coming down from its branch to find out if this moving object is edible. But the tortoise doesn't appear to be too concerned at its lack of discretion, because it knows that in the case of an emergency, salvation is close at hand, on its back to be precise. The tortoise is so sure of itself that when the two come face to face, it is the snake that feels intimidated, while the armor-plated reptile barely alters its course and continues impassively on its way. The efficient passive defense of a portable home has also been adopted by other survivors the length and breadth of our planet. Hermit crabs have soft, vulnerable bellies and so they steal the transportable houses of other marine invertebrates. The result is similar to that of the tortoise, except for the fact that the shell does not grow with them, so when it becomes too small, they have to return to the sea in search of a bigger one. Down here, hiding inside something can also be complicated because there is a great deal of competition. At least the hermit crabs wait until the shell's owner has died. As almost always, the home outlives its occupant and is used by others. Nomadic man also had to learn to carry his house with him. On the vast steppes of Mongolia, one of the most surprising shelters is still used, the Gur. It is transported on two camels and can be put up in just half an hour. In a place like this, a shelter must be ready for occupation as quickly as possible. The smoke hole acts as a sundial, and the interior is divided into symbolic quadrants. Women to the east, men to the west, and to the north, opposite the door, the guests and the altar to Buddha. These social norms are respected from Mongolia to Tibet in both emperor's palaces and Tatar's tents. <laughs> Nomadic people have to carry their belongings with them and need practical shelters that can be rapidly mounted. This is also true on the other side of the planet. In the Namibian desert, another traveler people solves the problem in a rather different way. The Himba are nomadic cattle herders forced to remain constantly on the move in search of pasture and water for their animals. For them, their cows are everything, the very symbol of their culture. They drink their milk, make clothes from their hides, use their fat to protect their skins, and perhaps most surprisingly of all, they even build their huts from cow dung. Mm -hmm. 
over a simple structure of branches, the Himba women spread a mixture of clay, bark fibers and dung. When it dries, this combination provides excellent insulation, protecting the Himba shelters from the heat. Many animals have learned to make use of the most abundant and easily obtainable material in each area. One example of this is to be found in Australia. The Australian weaver ants work as a team to build their shelters. In a coordinated manner, they place the leaves of this tree together using a special secretion to make a hanging ant's nest safe from enemies on the ground. In the animal kingdom, vegetable fibers, resistant and flexible as well as waterproof, are often used to build shelters. In Eastern Africa, we find other experts in how to use the leaves of certain trees. A number of species of weaver birds have one thing in common. As quickly as possible, the males must build a hanging nest from vegetable fibers. They choose a suitable branch and gauging the size from their bodies, they create the basic frame, weaving and knotting beneath the critical gaze of the females. Only those males whose work is of a sufficient standard will be able to mate. The skill of the male so important for success in reproduction is inherited, but requires considerable practice. And so the young males take some time to perfect their technique. If the nest is not right, no female will want to enter it. Trees adapt to the climate. That explains why their leaves are usually a good construction material, as can be seen far from here. Using the available plants for construction is also frequent among humans. Here on the coast of Papua New Guinea, there are palm trees all around, and so the inhabitants use them as the raw material for their houses. The structure of trunks tied together forms a high gabled roof very adequate for this damp, tropical, rainy climate. This type of construction is called the stilt house, characterized by the way in which the living quarters are raised above the ground in order to isolate them as much as possible from the damp. The roof structure is covered with palm leaves in overlapping rows, arranged in such a way that the direction of the fibers makes the water run off more efficiently. The wax on the leaves and their consistency have evolved on the palm tree to protect the trunk from the rain and they perform precisely the same function on the huts of the region. Generally, the most suitable building material comes from the same environment in which the house is to be built. And that rule applies to both humans and animals, even in places as distant from here as North America.
In the forests and prairies of Montana lives one of the most skilled construction workers of all, the beaver. Beavers build dams to block the river, raise the water level, and so ensure that the entrance to their homes remains underwater, making them inaccessible to predators. Generation after generation, they constantly add new branches to their dams. The end result is that the lake fills with sediment and eventually becomes a meadow. The first human beings to reach these North American forests must have been surprised to discover these clearings. It was there that they built their homes. Thus, the shelters of the beavers could have determined the location of present-day human settlements. Conflicts may arise when what for humans is building material is in itself the food and shelter of wild animals. That is precisely what occurs in the Chitwan National Park in southern Nepal. Once a year, these people enter the park to cut down the high grass from which they make their houses. But it is precisely here that two potentially very dangerous animals are to be found. Every year, some of these grass cutters are attacked by tigers or rhinoceroses they stumble across among the vegetation. But for them, this is a vital resource which they cannot afford to do without. To avoid chance encounters as far as possible, these men try to scare off the animals by talking very loud and making as much noise as they can. This pasture is called elephant grass due to its great height, capable of concealing even that enormous animal. This makes it useful both for the construction of human houses and as a refuge and hunting ground for the Indian rhinoceros and the tiger. The Bengal tiger steers clear of human beings whenever it can, but man is reducing its habitat to such an extent that in certain regions such as Chitwan, it is almost impossible to avoid encounters. The same is true for the Indian rhinoceros. Both are being pushed out of their final refuge as growing human populations exert increasing pressure. The elephant grasses also serve as food for the cattle, though they would not be so highly valued by these people if they were not the perfect construction material for the traditional rural homes of the region. Straw is probably the most frequently used roof covering in human shelters all over the world. Around 2500 BC, the arrival of agricultural techniques and the domestication of animals turned the nomadic hunter-gatherer into a sedentary species. And soon, the need arose for extra space in the home in which to store the crops and keep the cattle. The thick bundles of elephant grass must be packed tight together to make sure they don't let the rain through. Throughout the planet, the different human cultures discovered the best way to build their houses in accordance with the needs of each climate and the available materials.
This is the Ivory Coast in Western Africa, and this village belongs to the Lobi, whose main occupation is agriculture, though they are also hunters and possess some cattle. Their villages are composed of houses called shukala, in which the ground floor supports a flat roof on which the grain is dried. The walls are made of adobe, an ideal material in dry climates where it is necessary to build thick, heavy walls providing good insulation. Here the problem is the sun, not the rain, which is very scarce. So these homes can afford to have flat roofs and an entrance at ground level. The important thing is shade and protection from the stifling African heat. Very close to the Lobi, also in the Ivory Coast, live the Senufo, and as we saw in the case of the Mortri Caves in Peru, they go one step further and build shelters for the spirits. This hut with its exaggerated roof is a fetish house. Inside it, the Senufo keep religious carvings and ritual masks. The sacred nature of the dwelling is reinforced by the symbolic decoration of the external walls. Each fetish house has its assigned guardian, who is normally an important member of the Poro, the secret society that govern the religious life of the Senufo. In this way, using their capacity to invent, the different human cultures have adapted their homes to the different regions of the planet, seeking local solutions to the challenges of the climate and using the materials at hand in each case. But probably the most extreme case of a human shelter adapted to the environment in which it stands is to be found on the other side of the world, on the transparent waters of the Gulf of Tomini in Indonesia. They are called the sea gypsies because they almost never set foot on solid ground. The Bajau live in the ocean on board their canoes and in them they carry out their lives. <laughs> they say that on land they are cursed, that they would die just as quickly as a fish or a stranded turtle. They prefer their blue horizon, their existence in constant movement. Everything they need they obtain from the sea. They are perfectly happy in their floating homes. The government of Sulawesi wants them to live in normal houses and for the children to go to school. But they are reluctant to give up their lifestyle. Apparently, they took to the sea to escape from the wars at the start of the 17th century. Then their means of transport became their permanent home. These boats are now the only world they know, and in them they feel safe, one of the main characteristics of any shelter. The oldest can no longer walk, their legs have atrophied, and they use their feet for other tasks. According to an old Baha'u legend, a mother was consoling her child who was crying because his father had not come back, saying to him, don't ask why he does not return. For the people of the sea, the ocean is our home.